of the Union is not good. Gerald Ford said those words back in 1975 to describe the condition of the country that I love, the United States of America. At least he was honest and straight to the point. And I'm going to be talking about our nation today, and I'm going to be talking about our nation's pastime, because I believe that they are bound together in so many ways, more ways than we could even imagine, our nation and our nation's pastime. And I'll also tell you that, that I'm going to stir it up. You're going to leave here, and you're going to, you're going to either be a little bit irritated, or you're going to be a little bit surprised, because I'm going to do like him. I'm going to call it straight the way it is. What is the state of our union? First of all, what is our union? Gentlemen, we are united by our love and passion for sports, specifically the sport of baseball. What is the state of that union? Well, I'll tell you, baseball has progressed. We're to the point now where winning is important in baseball, especially in college baseball. There's pressure. There's pressure to win. Back when I started coaching all them many years ago, I was told in my first college job, the only way you're going to lose your job is if you blow the roof off the budget or sleep with the secretary. Now, 30 years later, you got to add in and you need the expectation of winning too. So what happens when you have that expectation of winning? Sometimes you give in to the temptation of possibly having to do what it takes to win. And sometimes... We compromise integrity and character in the name of winning. But we have to resist the temptation to do that. We have to believe that character and integrity will be rewarded. Now, there's a lot of times you could compromise on character and integrity and nobody would know. Now, i got great assistance at Gardner-Webb. And those guys share the same values that I do in a lot of ways. And they know that I will not compromise on our character. And they won't either. And we're not perfect, but we don't compromise, even if nobody else will know. So my first point today to you is this. Do what's right, even when it hurts. Now you're about to see on the screen a picture of two gentlemen who have both appeared in professional baseball games in recent times. Now I'm not here to debate on whether they deserve to be in a, in a game or not. But what I am saying is this. One of them is a character and one of them has character and we need to know the difference that's important in sports but i told you i was going to talk about our nation and it's important uh, military soldiers our guys i want those guys to be strong and i want them to be tough and i want them to win but i also want them to stand for something bigger i want them to rise above the methods of Al-Qaeda and, and ISIS and all those terrorists that threaten our way of life. And I get that when you're fighting in a battle, you need, don't need to worry about what's fair and what's not fair. But still, our guys need to stand for something right. Stand for something bigger, because there's always something bigger at stake than winning. And that is doing what is right, what is morally right at all times. The great human divide that separates men is those who know what's right from those who do what's right. We need to do what's right. Some of you guys may say after, uh, after seeing me up here today, say, wow, that strap guy from Gardner-Webb that can't pronounce his last name. If you look at it there, I don't know how I got strap out of that. But you might say, that strap guy, he's a real man of character, but you don't really know. How do you know? Anybody can stand up here and say all the right things. It's doing the right thing that makes you a man of character. But isn't winning always right? Wasn't it Vince Lombardi that said winning isn't everything, it's the only thing? Well, he also said later in his life, I wish I would never said the thing. I meant the effort, I meant the goal, I never meant for people to crush human values and morality. Winning is so much more important than whether or not you have more runs on that scoreboard than the other team. Chuck Noll, an NFL coach himself said, a life of frustration is inevitable for any coach whose main enjoyment comes from winning. If winning was the most important thing, guys, then Lance Armstrong would still be one of the most popular athletes in America. And pro sports are starting to figure it out. 
They're figuring it out because they're starting to discipline guys, people, for their off-field behavior. Why? Because society has elevated sports to a position of prominence. And with that comes the obligation to improve society, and they're figuring that out. D.L. Moody said this. He said, our greatest fear in life should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things that don't really matter. Guys, character matters. Why does it matter? Because you might be the one coaching that next military soldier. You might be coaching the next principal of a school. You might be coaching the next company executive. You might be coaching the next coach. And that coach may end up coaching your son or daughter. You might be coaching the next president. And boy, didn't we have some interesting choices to choose from this time. Seems to me we had plenty of characters, maybe not enough character. So who are we counting on to instill character in this next generation? I think a lot of times we end up counting on institutions too much, like, like those government and politicians. In my lifetime, the Oval Office has seen a president who lied and then tried to erase the tapes that proved he lied. And then a few years after that, we had a, a president who respected the Oval Office so much that he wouldn't even take off his coat jacket in there. But right after him, a few years later, we had a president got in the Oval Office and took off a whole lot more than his coat jacket and found time to have an affair while he was president. These guys, our elected leaders, should have the highest character in the world. But that's not what's happening. A lot of times they end up they end up trading more insults than they do ideas. It's not about character, it's about character assassination. They've turned into cartoon characters on Saturday Night Live. And some of them play right along with them. We wonder why kids today don't respect authority. And we got people who are our elected officials, our highest character people, and they want to be cool. They don't want to be respected, they want to be elected. Schools. Are we going to count on schools to be the ones who instill character? Well, some of them do a great job, and a lot of you guys teach in schools, and you do a great job, but it seems to me sometimes the higher-ups are more concerned about which bathroom or which locker room the boys or the girls are going to be assigned to. Is that happening in your state, too? Churches. Unfortunately, we've had leaders in that realm drop routine fly balls, too. In fact, statistics show now that really only about 20% of people in our country attend a church regularly. Parents, starts at home. Some of you are doing a great job. Some of the parents are doing a great job. But just as many are obsessed with playing time and college scholarships. Celebrities, we're going to count on them to lead us in character. Rock stars, movie stars. All you got to do is watch five minutes of one of their award shows or read a couple of their tweets on Twitter to know that character is not the top of their priority list. Bottom line, guys, if society is going to change, we the people who have the influence have to be the ones to start it. We have to stand in that gap and fill that void left by all these entities that can't get the bunt down. Why coaches? Why us? I agree with Billy Graham. And he said, a coach will impact more people in one life, in one year, than most people will in a lifetime. Guys, you will impact more people this season than most people will ever. Are you going to use that influence to engage in a bunch of crude, disrespectful locker room talk so the guys will think you're cool? And so they'll like you? Or are you going to use those words to help mold character? I will tell you, we all want to win. And character will help you win. Character wins. Talent alone is never going to do it. John Gordon said, talent without character is like a race car without a steering wheel. It drives fast and it looks pretty, but without something to guide it, it's going to crash at some point. The key is balance. We can't let the pendulum swing one way too far or the other. On one side, you have um, 
your kid who's Mr. Killer Instinct, out of control, win at all costs, no boundaries guy. On the other side, you have Mr. Nice Guy, who wants everybody to like him, to the point that he won't compete as hard as he can for fear that somebody might get mad at him. Mr. Killer Instinct Guy will embarrass you, and Mr. Nice Guy will disappoint you. We talk about foxhole guys all the time. Who are we taking that foxhole with us? You take Mr. Killer Instinct out of control guy, and you might be the one that ends up shooting. You take Mr. Nice Guy, and you better have a real good life insurance plan for your family after you're gone. If, if you don't have balance, your, your team is either a bunch of out of control jerks, or your team is soft. And I don't know which one's worse. But I will tell you, the balance is character. Character will compete with passion. And character will compete with every fiber of energy. But it won't cross those lines of ethics and morality. And by the way, don't ever accuse a coach who emphasizes character of not being competitive. You watch a true man of character compete. Now, I had this situation come up a few years ago with a team that I was coaching. Had a lot of type A personalities. A lot of guys who were very emotional, maybe volatile, very competitive. And I felt the need that year to keep an even keel a little bit more, to keep things on an even keel. And the rumors started getting around, it got back to me, that the guys didn't think that I was competitive enough. Coach lost a little bit of his competitive fire. So I invited one of the leaders on that team one morning to meet me at the racquetball court, which he agreed. And I got to tell you guys, I failed that morning. Because I beat him 15 to nothing the first game, but I only beat him 15 to 2 the second one. But I didn't hear anything more about anybody saying coach wasn't competitive. If you're going to be a coach who emphasizes character and you're competitive, you're going to have some ethical dilemmas in our game. Now, when I was, when my son was very young, my oldest son, he called me out on something in our game. He said, Dad, y'all should not be still in second base. And I said, why not? And he said, well, because it's stealing and it's wrong because it's breaking one of the commandments. And I said, well, no, in the, in the context of baseball, it's okay. It's expected. He said, oh, so the other team doesn't mind if you take the base? And I said, well, yeah, they're, they're trying to stop us from doing it. He said, well, then it's wrong and you shouldn't be doing it. And I said, you know what? You're probably right. And, and he's grown up now, and he's in law enforcement, believe it or not. But, that, but there are some things. We all try to influence the umpires, and we teach our players to frame the pitch, and, and we teach them the, 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 you know, the, the slap tag to try to look like he's out. And if you trap a ball, you hold it up and make it look like you caught it. Nobody has a lot of problem with that. But there might be some other things we need to think about. And you see them listed up there. I'm not going to go into detail on them with the decoys and the maybe trying to get hit by the pitch intentionally or swinging late to get catcher's interference or teaching a balk move or <clears throat> intentionally throwing at hitters, those kinds of things. I don't have answers for you. I just want you to think about it. And you're also going to have dilemmas in our profession too, not just in the game but in the profession. College coaches, over-recruiting at the player's expense at times. I've actually heard of people who, at times have recruited a player so they wouldn't have to play against them. Is that ethical? I'm not, a, I'm not answering the question. I'm asking the question. Bending the rules a little bit, especially when nobody would know the rules of recruiting, your high school regulations. Could you bend the rules and get away with it? Verbal commitments. Travel ball coaches, high school coaches. If your player makes a verbal commitment, don't keep shopping him around. You make him stay to his word. Okay? College coaches, if we sign somebody and they have a little drop-off and a little slump sometime during their senior year, you don't drop them and give their scholarship to somebody else. Now, I realize there's times when kids have catastrophic injuries and they're not the product you thought they were going to be, but you know what I'm talking about. Dropping a kid because you've seen somebody better and you tell him you don't want him anymore. Am I making a judgment about that's ethical? 
A little bit. Yes. Other things, um, you know, honor, if we, we, especially in college, we agree not to exchange scouting reports and we do handshakes. And I've heard of people saying that they wouldn't exchange. And then later, instead of exchanging, they just said, I'll just give it to you over the phone. And that's okay then. That didn't violate the handshake. Come on, man. Ethical dilemmas, guys. We're all going to have them. By the way, you don't, need, you don't need me to be your moral compass. I'm not perfect. I've moved that golf ball around a little bit out of the rough when nobody was looking. I've exceeded the speed limit a little bit. I pulled the tag off a mattress, and I've exaggerated how big my fish was that I caught. So you don't need me preaching to you. But here's what I am telling you. You need to decide what your line is, and you need to stick to it in all situations. If you're going to be ruthless, be ruthless all the time. At least we'll all know where you stand. But don't give me that excuse that it's the new normal. Don't tell me everybody else is doing it. Don't tell me you've got to compromise a little bit of character to be able to be successful in this business. Everybody else is doing it. What if one of your children, for you guys that are parents, would come to you and say that they were doing drugs or having sex? Because everybody else was doing it. You know what you're going to do? You're going to give them the old what if everybody else is jumping off the cliff speech. Tell me it's the new normal. Let me ask you this question, guys. When you started out coaching, how many of you set out and said, I want to be normal. I want to be average. I'm going to be middle of the pack. Not a one of you. You set out to be exceptional. So be exceptional in everything, including your character. And don't jump off the cliff with coaches of average character. And I'll tell you one way you know how you've arrived at character, at least you're headed that direction, is when you realize that it's not about you. The sport of baseball does not exist for your resume. The sport of baseball exists for your influence. Your players do not exist to help you win games. You exist to help your players win life. Baseball is not the end product. Baseball is a tool to achieve the end product. And the end product is young men of character. And I gotta tell you, we got some work to do with this generation. And I am not even close to being the first person up here on this stage or anywhere else to talk about the trophy generation, the generation me, the entitlement, whatever we want to call it, that trophy generation. Tanner Bull said in the Bad News Bears back in in the 70s in the original movie, he said, you can take your trophy and your apology and shove it. I'm going to stop there because I'm trying to keep this rated PG or below. But I think you get it because that's how most people feel about trophies now. They don't mean very much. Jameis Winston doesn't even know where his Heisman Trophy is. If you don't believe me, Google that. He doesn't know where it is. Giving everybody a trophy isn't teaching anybody character any more than playing Pokemon Go is teaching anybody geography. I got a trophy that means something to me, guys. I got one that means something. It was mentioned earlier that that um, Kendall character and coaching award. And I was very privileged yesterday to see my really good coaching friend, Rich Maloney, receive that same award. And he'll agree with me. That thing means something to us. If there's a fire at the strap house, I'm getting that thing out. And when I get outside, if there's still a little time left over, I might go back in and get a couple family members. Okay, I'm, I'm going to get burned for that. Sorry, it's not true, but I'll tell you this much. My dog might be in trouble because I'm getting that thing out. Speaking of firemen, there are places in our country that have had to lower the standards of what it takes to be a fireman because people protested and said it wasn't fair. The standards were too high. Now, let me ask you this. You're lying there in a the fire, unconscious, clutching your Kindle Award. Do you want to be picked up and carried out? 
Or do you want to be dragged out with your head bouncing on every step by somebody who couldn't meet the standard? Now, I was there in Nashville in 1996 when John Scalinas gave that speech. And he said, don't widen home plate. Don't change the standard. I got a, a player that played for me a, a couple years ago, and he, he's now a, a state trooper in the great state of North Carolina. And I've been told that there's a shortage of troopers in North Carolina. But I've also been assured that they're not lowering the standard to try to get people to, to get more people. They work in extra shifts. The problem is the world's too concerned about what's fair. Now I will tell you right now, and my children will tell you, I got three boys, and they knew never to say that something wasn't fair in my house because they knew the answer they were going to get. Dad, that's not fair. I'll say, guys, the fair comes once a year down there off Highway 74 near Shelby, North Carolina. It's got a Ferris wheel, a bearded lady, and a monster truck. And it's only there for a week, and then it's gone. And it's the only fair I know, and it's not real. And I think the beard's fake, too. Come on. you got to teach our guys that life isn't fair. If you lose, you don't take your ball and go home. If you don't get to play, you don't pout and whine and cry and blame it on everybody else. There's no crying in baseball. And if your candidate doesn't win the election, you don't stomp on and burn the American flag. Guys, America has been good to baseball. Baseball should be good to America. And I get it that there's times in sports when you need to use that platform to protest. I understand that. But I will tell you this much. As long as I'm the baseball coach at Gardner-Webb University, our program will respect that national anthem and that flag. Hallelujah. I'm not mad, guys. I'm just passionate. I'd love to come up here and talk about hitting or base running or fielding or whatever. But this is my number one passion that I could share with you, and that's character. And, and that generation, me, that trophy generation, you know what? It's our fault. We're the ones that created it. We handed out all the trophies. All the kids did was accept them. We created the problem. We need to do something about it. You need to reteach your players that life isn't fair. You need to reteach your players that the world doesn't owe them anything. And you need to be a role model of perseverance when you don't get your way. Charles Barkley was wrong. You don't have a choice. When he said, I'm not a role model, he didn't understand that when you've been given that elevated position in sports or society, people are watching you. And they watch how you handle, your kids watch how you handle adversity. Now, we, we've all heard that quote, adversity doesn't produce character, it reveals it. And we tend to think about the players when we think about that. But think about yourself. What do you do when things go wrong at practice or in a game? Do you rant and rave and curse and swear and go to the under, other end of the bench and tell them they're all terrible? Or you try to stay focused and do something about it? Those kids are watching. Tony Dungy has quoted some research that says, in times of crisis, people don't always gravitate to the person in charge or the person who's the most competent. They tend to gravitate to the person of the highest character because they believe that person will do what's right. Your players are watching. They watch how you handle failure. They watch how you handle success. They watch how you handle umpires. They watch how you handle administrators. They watch how you handle your marriage and family. And chances are, if they respect you, they're gonna grow up and be the same kind of coach, father, and husband you are. And yet statistics show that 50% of all men are unfaithful to their wives. And I get it, guys. I've been married 30 years. Marriage has its challenges. But character is committed. Character perseveres. And those kids are watching. I'll tell you what else they're watching. They're watching how you handle parents. And parents present one of the greatest challenges for coaches today. And I will tell you this. 
They're going to criticize your own field decisions, and you might as well get used to that. But don't you ever give them any ammunition to criticize the type of influence you are on their son. And I realize it's tough at times to be respectful to people who are nasty, dishonorable, and disrespectful to us. And I get that. But we've got to resist the temptation when that happens to fight fire with fire. Don't lower yourself. You might win and you might have ammunition, but you've lowered yourself. I got a box full of letters in my office, guys, from my 30 years of coaching. And I will tell you that many of those letters, some of those letters from parents are extremely unpleasant. And most of them I never responded to. And I had plenty of ammunition, but I don't want to lower myself to that level. Lily Tomlin said, the problem with being in the rat race is that even if you win, you're still a rat. Don't lower yourself to people of lesser character. So where are we headed? Future's so bright, I gotta wear shades. Guys, I'm an eternal optimist. I have a reason to be an eternal optimist. In a different context, I'll talk about that all day long, if you ever wanna talk about that. But while I'm still here, I'm an optimist about baseball. And I believe we're gonna be okay as long as we cling to the values of integrity and character in our programs and in our lives. John Wooden said, if you sacrifice principle trying to please everyone, you end up pleasing no one. It starts with knowing who you are. Don't ever compromise who you are to get what you want. About 20 years ago, I had the opportunity to, uh, to work a clinic with, with a person I consider a coaching legend, uh, Pat McMahon. And when we were working that clinic, one of the things he said was treat everybody you encounter with respect. And that made an impression on me. And it made an impression not because he just said that, because for that whole weekend I saw him, I saw him do that, including with me, a, a young coach. Guys, I've been a middle school coach. I've been a high school coach. I've been an assistant coach in college. I've been a head coach at junior college. Division two and now Division one, and in all that time, I never moved up. I moved forward. Moving up implies that there's some kind of pecking order in our profession, that there's some kind of hierarchy, and that there's people higher who are more important than other people. And I got to tell you, I don't buy that. I've been at every level, and I don't buy that at all. And there's this term I became familiar with. When I first started coaching, it's called big leaguing. Now I'm sounding like I'm mad, guys, but I'm just passionate. I'm not mad. Big leaguing. That's when someone perceives that they're pretty high on this hierarchy and they treat the people who they perceive as a little lower on the hierarchy with less respect. And it's wrong. And I'll tell you why it's wrong, because it's a sign of insecurity. Humility is a great sign of character. And I'll tell you another reason why, from a practical standpoint, what goes around comes around. And when it comes to interview time, you better be a people person because that's what they're looking for today more than what you know about, about baseball, a people person. John Scalinas, that same speech I was sitting there listening to, he said, what does it profit a man if he gains all the baseball knowledge in the world and wins the championship every season if he doesn't influence people properly. Coaching is one of the most noble professions known to mankind because of its capacity to influence others. William Barclay said there are two great days in a man's life, the day he's born and the day he discovers why. I would say to you guys in your coaching life, there are two great days in your coaching life, the first day you were allowed to be called coach and the day you realized you were given that privilege to be a positive influence on others. I've been coaching 30 years. You notice how I keep saying that? Because it amazes me. I can't believe that I'm that old and somebody's let me coach that long. 
And I have former players, and they all still, some of them are almost my age, because I started at 22, 23, and they still call me coach. I'll always be their coach. What a privilege and a responsibility. You know that box full of letters I mentioned earlier? The vast majority of those are positive, encouraging, and grateful. So, what's the state of our union and what's the future? It's up to you. The torch is being passed to a new generation. I'm not going to be around forever. I don't think 30 years from now I'll still be coaching. Hope I'll still be alive. But it's kind of up to you. I, I'm, gonna, I'm an optimist. I told you about that. I'm getting a little passionate today, but I'm not mad. I'm optimistic about baseball and about life. And I'm going to borrow a few words from William Arthur Ward. And he said this about our great nation, but I'm going to apply it to baseball. I am grateful for baseball's glorious past. I am awed by its unbelievable present. I am confident of its limitless future. Now I realize I'm kind of out of my league up here, guys. I, I'm, I don't have national name recognition. I hadn't coached multiple championships, and I'm not a sports celeb. Anyway, I'm not a famous guy. And I've always wondered this. Why is it that only famous people can do quotes? Can't the rest of us spell and make rhymes too? I mean, every quote has to have a famous person's name. Guys, in the course of me talking to you today, I counted them up the other day. I've got 38 quotes, and about half of them are mine. But if they were to appear publicly somewhere now, it would be the quote, and underneath it would say anonymous, because I don't have name recognition. And you know what? I don't care. That doesn't bother me, because I think, and, and we have sport, uh, coaching celebrities and people in our sport that do a great job of representing us. But maybe the rest of us have something to say, too. Maybe baseball's just as much for us. And I love this, and I love being part of this fraternity of coaches, and I want us to be the good guys. I want the nation's pastime to be the nation's inspiration. When my kids were growing up, every day I took them to school, which was a privilege. And when they opened that door to get out, I said the same thing every day, and I say it now when they leave the house as they're older, when they go somewhere, I said, hey, wherever you go, you take that name with you. I would say the same to you, coaches. Wherever you go, you take the name coach with you. 